All right, let's get started. Um, any questions or things people want to make sure we talk about today? This is like the last full lecture, right? So, yeah. Because we're. Okay, so yeah, just to give a sketch of what we're up to with the rest of the semester. So, here we are on um, 14th. So, Monday is the 17th, and that, like, that's a holiday, so there's no class, right? Um, so, on the 19th and 21st, so I've, I've confirmed now guest lectures for both days. Um, so, yeah, that'll be fun. And then the last week of the semester, am I doing this right? This will be... 24, 26, and 28. Those are all three final project exhibition days. Um, I'm trying to get a list from the people who run the I2I, Inf Invitation to Innovation, so I can find out who signed up for the 28th, and also to find out if people can still sign up if they want to. Um, but if you didn't sign up for the 28th, then I will randomly assign you to the 24th or 26th. I'll let you know by, I guess, by Wednesday of next week, I hope. Um, but really, you should be ready to go either day. Um, and that will be during this time slot in the lobby of the third floor. That's where that, the demos will be. Um, any questions about project stuff? So there's a checkpoint due. There's a checkpoint that checkpoint two. Right now on, um, on the GitHub, it says the 16th. I'm going to move it to the 17th, so you can work through the weekend if you want to. Um, other, any other project things? Okay. Um, okay. So I wanted to set up what we're going to be doing today. Um, we're going to be talking about infinite streams which is where exactly where we left off on Wednesday. I'll show you how to make those, what they do. Um, we're going to write the code for add streams. It's pretty simple. Add two streams together, get a third stream coming out. Um, we're going to look at defining Fibonacci in terms of streams. And it has a really elegant sort of definition that has the properties of um, efficient computation. Um, we're going to look at um, how delay and force, the, which are implicit in streams, we want to look at how they're implemented. And then we're going to look at a, a, a spec for how memoization can work. I've talked about memoization, which is the idea that after you force a value, it gets stored in the closure. By the way, without, which, without memoization, the efficiency of streams is abysmal, and no one would use them. So it's like a, you need to do that. Uh, and then the last thing we want to look at is um, generating streams of primes. And in particular, with the culmination of the whole streams unit is this brilliant um, invention for, for um, an algorithm for generating primes that was invented in, like, 300 BC by a Greek mathematician named um, Eratosthenes. So his invention is called the sieve of Eratosthenes, and it has a really elegant uh, representation using schemes. It's really cool. So that's where we're going to finish. All right, any questions now? Yeah. Um, Okay, so let's look at defining some infinite streams. So it, it's, well, it's pretty easy. Um, all you have to do is make a recursion that never terminates. And now you can, you can do that now. So remember we had our, um, um, our, enumerate, our stream enumerate interval, which had a start number and an end number. So this one's not the infinite one. And we said if... Um, if start got advanced beyond end through recursion, then we were done and we returned the empty stream. Otherwise, we um, did a constream of the start 
value to the, the delayed recursion. So this is where the stream stuff comes in. To a recursive call to ourselves, stream enumerate interval, incrementing the start and still passing in the end. So that, that was the, the code we were looking at to generate a finite stream. To generate an infinite stream, all you do is you like never stop. So we get rid of that code. We no longer need an end position. Um, and uh, yeah, I think one of the prints goes away. That now is an infinite stream. So it starts, it has a fixed starting point. You would say like, for example, you could say like define the stream of natural numbers. Do natural numbers start at one or zero? Okay, that's what I thought. So now we'll just call it enumerate, or stream enumerate. There's no interval anymore, it's infinite. Stream enumerate starting at one. And that's an infinite stream. Um, so, you know, when you, if you were to run this code, it would call this procedure, all right, we're going we're gonna to name it stream enumerate now. This is messy, but oh well. Stream enumerate. Okay, so it will, stream enumerate is called with one. It's going to do con stream of one to a recursive call. So it makes a con cell. It puts a one in the car position. In the critter position is the delayed recursion. And so you just have a single con cell. If you force it, then, so if you ask for the stream cutter, then this gets forced, and then this recursion um, happens. So then it will call itself with a value of two. And so then that will form another con cell with a two in it and another um, promise. So now that, that cell will point at this, and so on. So, in it, you know, the more the more elements of the stream you ask for, you just keep getting them, and it never ends. So, okay. So now we've defined an, an abstraction for an infinite stream. Yeah, Matt. When you force the footer, when you, when you force the footer, uh, does it recreate the entire stream um, with a new value in the, in the footer position, or does it somehow change the value? Yeah, great question. So when you force the cutter, does it recreate the whole stream or does it replace what's here? So it replaces what's there. So that instead of being a promise, it becomes a, it's still a procedure object. Um, actually, this would be a good point to show what the delay and force look like. Um, but it's now a procedure object that has been forced and so it has different stuff inside of it. So let's, let's look at that. That's a totally reasonable transition. So implicit in um, the way streams have been working is this concept of delay. Um, and so to delay an expression like this expression, you want to do stream enumerate interval with adding one to the start. So this is a special form. You don't evaluate the expression. And if, if you go back to thinking about like the code you wrote for the Metacircular Evaluator where you were intercepting code and rewriting it, you would rewrite this as um, it's a lambda definition of no arguments that when, when evaluated causes the expression to be evaluated. So you just take that expression and wrap it, wrap it with a lambda. So then you get a procedure object. So now what happens, how do you force the procedure object? So what force would look like in this case it's just a, a procedure definition. You don't need, um, you don't need to play like um, tricks of it being special. You just take that object and, um, and ask it to apply itself to no arguments. Um, so you just get the procedure object and tell it to apply itself. So then it would, it would go ahead and do its thing. 
Um, in the case of the um, stream enumerate, it would generate the next con cell with a promise inside of that. Now, at this point, the thing inside, going back to Matt's question, the thing inside this con cell is still that procedure. So if you ever had to ask for its value again, if this is the whole story, you would have to force it again. It would have to run its code again. And so if you were like 10, if you were looking for the 10th element of the stream, when you asked for the value of that 10th element, you would have to do the, all of them until you got there, and then it would have a value. So that would not memoize. It would be terrible. It wouldn't, I mean, it would work, but it would be so inefficient that no one would ever use it. So you need a better way of delaying where it's able to keep track of what's happened. So here's, a, here's an example of how you can memoize. So we're just going to write some scheme code that will explain how instead of um, when you want to delay an expression, you don't simply wrap it with a lambda. You wrap it with a lambda that also has the ability to memoize. So here's what it looks like. We're just going to call it memo proc. And you're going to give it a procedure object. And you want it to wrap it with memoization capability. So we're going to define, we're going to make a closure, a frame that has two bindings in it. The first frame, the first binding is we want to know if we've already run the procedure once. And we'll initialize that to false, because when we first create this, it won't have been run. And then if it has been run, we want to keep track of what the result was so we don't have to regenerate it. So we're going to make a binding for a result value that will just initialize to false. Um, really, we're not going to ever look at the value of result unless we know it's already been run. Um, and then inside that frame, um, we're going to make the lambda definition. And Sorry, that doesn't go there. And inside this lambda, we're going to check and see if we've already run it. Let's say if we haven't run it. So if not already run. So if we haven't already run it, then we're going to carry out the procedure and save its, its results. So we'll do a begin statement here. So this is the true case of the begin. If we haven't run it, then we're going to do a few things. Where um, I just have to I leave myself enough room for indentation here. First thing we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and run it and capture the result. So we're going to apply the procedure to no arguments. Remember, this procedure is an object that already knows how to run itself. It's already been wrapped up. We just have to wrap it with another thing that memoizes its, its answer. So this, this is the actual forcing. This is where the work gets done. It, in the case of this, the, enumerate, the stream enumerate, it would create a new con cell with another promise embedded in, that, in the coder of that con cell. That thing comes back. That's the result. Um, we're going to set result to be that that value. We're going to set um, already run to be true because we just ran it. By the way, this code's in the book, so like, don't feel the need to copy it down unless you want to. So already run, we're going to say is true. And now we're going to return the result. So we just ran it, kept track of the fact that we ran it, we cached the result, so now we're going to return the result. So that's the end of the uh, begin series. It's also the actual um, thing that gets returned. Um, otherwise, if we have already run it, well, then we've already run it. We've already cached the result. So we're just going to hand the result back. We don't have to run it again. And we're going to close um, the if statement. and. Sorry. And then yeah, then we're done. We're closing the rest of the thing. So that's an example of how to do memoization. Um, a lot of scheme is built inside of itself. So this is actually pretty close to what's, what's really happening. 
Um, so this, so what this means is there's like when when you start creating streams, like there's a lot of stuff bound up in each of the, you know, the con cells. It's got a whole procedure inside of it. It's got an environment frame with these two bindings. Um, there's so there's some inefficiencies there. It, there's actually there's some space issues, and we're going to look at them in in, in this lecture. Um, so it's not nearly as like simple as a list. If you have a list of a million con cells, you know that's pretty much each. If it, you're in a 32-bit world, that's two 32-bit pointers, right? So you're not using up that much memory. These actually do consume memory. Each item in the stream consumes a little bit of memory that, that you definitely have to think about when you're building real systems. Um, so that's memoization. OK. Um, I want to go back to the defining of an infinite stream and show another way of doing it. So here we built a straight up recursion that cons our start value to a recursive call. We can do something that's even more clever. Let's make a stream of num the number of ones. This is going to be an infinite stream of ones. All we have to do is con stream the number one to our self. That's an infinite stream of ones. So thinking about what this might look like, okay, so clearly the car of the first um, con cell has got a one in it. If we ask for the stream cutter, it's a recursive call. So then that does another cons of one to another recursive call and so on. So we can ask for as many ones as we want, and each time we ask for one, we cons a one in to the stream that we're building up. So that's an infinite stream of ones. All right, so let's say we wanted to do an infinite stream of the natural numbers using a, a clever way. Um, we're first going to define add streams. We're going to be able to add two streams together. So let's do that. All right, so we're going to add two streams together. Um, to be complete, we're going to assume that these may not be infinite streams. So the streams could end. So we're going to decide that if either one of these streams ends, then the sum of the streams is over. Like one of them might want to keep going, but if one of them's done, we're done. So we're going to say if either um, stream stream one is null or stream two is null, we're done. And we're going to return the empty stream. You know, this code should feel like deja vu because uh, I mean, I've already said this a couple times, but this is just like if you were to write add lists. So far, you just cross the word stream out, well, all the way through, you just cross the word stream out, and it would work on lists. So it's the same, it's the same recursive structure that we've been doing since the class began. OK, so what are we going to do in the, in the case where they're not null, where we know that we've got something at the head of both of the streams? What do you think, Patrick? What's that? So we're going to con stream. We do it like one piece at a time. So we actually do the addition on the, the cars, and then we defer the rest of it to a recursion. So we actually concretely add um, stream car of S1 and stream car of S2. So we added the head, the head elements of all streams. And we cons that with a recursion on the cutters. So we just call ourselves, I'm abbreviating that, stream cutter. I've totally run out of room of the first stream, stream cutter of the second stream, and then close all the parentheses. So that's add streams.
So you guys see how to write this code. So when you go into the streams code, like you look at all, like look at stream map, stream filter. There's a more general version of add streams that you're going to do for the problem set. Um, that it's it is like really it's just replacing cons null car and cutter with the stream versions. It's the same form. Of course, it has this totally different behavior because the the recursive call doesn't happen until the the stream element is forced. Okay, so at that point, let's um, let's actually switch to the keyboard. I want to show this code running. Okay, I think I've got the ones in here. Yeah, so I've, I've got the stream of ones. It's already there. So to show that that works, we could say stream ref of ones. Show me like the zeroth element of it. It's a one. All right, let me just, that's going to happen every time, so let me just do this. Okay, and now if we look at the stream, only one element of it exists, which is the same as if I had, like, if I just, Re, um, reevaluate the buffer and I don't ask for the, the zeroth element, it still exists. It's got one, it's one console. Um, if I do stream ref, so this is stuff we've been doing the last two sessions. If I do stream ref of ones, give me the one, th oh, the, which is the second, the second one. It should still be a one, yeah. But now if we look at the stream, um, oh, yeah, this is this interesting way that it displays recursion, right? We saw this with the environment diagrams. Who encountered this and asked about it? What do you, yeah, Doug, right. So, and then, um, Brian, you were the one who, like, found the documentation. Do you remember, like, how it was described in that? It's like a, like a reference to Okay, yeah. It's like the way it describes uh, graphs. Yeah, yeah. Right, so what it's saying is the, this object and that object are the same object. Yeah, yeah. So when the cutter, oh, so this one is going to be a little, well, let's see what happens if we get a few more objects. I guess we just keep getting the same object in the cutter. Let's, like, reference um, the hundredth one. And now look at what ones is. Yeah, okay, so this behaves differently. There's some sort of optimization. That's cool. Okay, but we can believe that regardless of how many items we force, um, we're going to get a stream of ones. Um, so let's let's make a stream of twos. So we'll define twos to be add streams. The st a stream of ones with so we're lining the two like streams up like parallel beneath one another. All right, and let's look at twos. Okay, now this one won't have that optimization because we're using add streams, which is the version I just wrote on the paper, um, to cons up, to like grab the ones out of each of the one streams, con stream them together. So we're building up a third stream. That's really important to recognize that this, two stream is a third separate thing in memory. So if we, like, let's reference the second item of it. Okay, they should all be two. But now it actually is building up these con cells as we ask for them. Right. You guys can see that. Okay. So now let's think about how we would define, now that we know we can do this, let's think about how we de would define a stream of integers with this self-referential sort of approach. Or we'll call it the nats, the natural numbers. Um, Okay, actually, hold on. I want to make sure I get this right. Oh, 
this is, well, this is, all right, whatever. All right, we're going to start this off with the number one. So the first number of our sequence is going to be concretely the number one. And then the second number in the sequence is we're going to do an add streams of um, our stream of ones with our self. Close, close. Let's think about what this does. Um, okay, so our stream of ones each time we ask for it, we're going to get a 1. We know that. It's the stream of 1s. Let's look at what the stream of nats is. So what's the first, the first uh, object in the stream of nats? Yeah, it's that 1. What's the second object in the stream of nats when we ask for it? It's going to add from this, the, the head of the 1s, and then it's going to add from the head of the gnats. So it's going to add those together, and then they go here. Right? And will that work continuously? Will we, I mean, obviously we expect it to. What happens when we go for the next item in the streams of gnats? So add streams is going to then, add streams has got the two streams like lined up, but they're offset by one. So the next time add streams goes to grab the next item, it's going to grab this one and this two and add them together and make this three. Because they're sort of, they're one stream is behind the other um, because the one started at the very beginning, the nats, but it sort of doesn't matter the position of the ones because it's all one all the time. Um, do we even need this? Could we add gnats to itself? What would happen if we add gnats to itself? What would that do? Do. Okay, so here's nuts. First item is definitely a one. Okay, the second item is we're going to get the, the first item twice and add together. The next item will get the second, the item just behind it. So this is going to make a stream like this, isn't it? People see people see that, or did they see a different answer? Let's try these out. I think I've got Nats already set up here. Oh, that's a different one. Okay, so we're going to call it. Um, let's find the ones. I'll put it near that. All right. Oh, I think we called it ints. Yeah, okay. So here's the one that is the first one we looked at. Let's make uh, another one of these guys. Like, uh, we'll call it, well, well, we'll see if this one is actually like powers of two. So con stream, we start off with one, and then the, the next one is we're going to add together the prior one, um, powers and powers. <coughs> Okay, that's the one that's right there. That's a two. Yep. So streams can be defined in terms of themselves. Um, and they can be skewed in this way. So let's do Fibonacci like this. And this is the this is gonna be one of the elegant versions of Fibonacci. Um, well here, I'm just gonna put this up on the screen.
So, all right, this is a Fibonacci starting at zero. The next Fibonacci is going to be one. And now the next Fibonacci is going to be the, the one that is the stream cutter. So what is, at this point, what is stream cutter of fibs? What, what number is that at this point in the game? Is it the one or the zero? All right, how many people think it's the one? How many people think it's the zero? Okay, well, this would be the stream. This would be fibs itself, is this stream. The stream cutter of fibs is this one. So this is a one. And then fibs is like fibs is constream of zero, so it's a zero. So the next item is a one. And then it it just keeps going. So that basically this stream cutter is the one that's one behind. And fibs itself is two behind. So that's the, the definition we saw of Fibonacci, is take the last number and the number before that and add them together, and then you've got the next one. So then we get our stream of 0, 1, 1. And then we have a 1 and a 1 that gets added. We get a 2, and we get the 1 and the 2, and the 3, 5, 8, and so on. So what's really sweet about this is with memoization, it behaves like super efficient because at the point where you're asking for this, this like this one whatever nth one that is you've already calculated the two prior ones and they're memoized so there's no work to go find them and then you can you know you can just keep progressing forward and calculating without memoization if if you're down in the recursion and you want the one that's like just behind you, you have to go and re-add them all up to get there. And then if you want to get that one, you have to add all those up. And then each of those entails more addings up. So it becomes like, it becomes equivalent to the like doubly recursive version of Fib. You guys remember when we did Fibonacci, like the way that looks elegant, um, Fib of N, the elegant solution is you know, we have a con statement that says if n is 0, then 0. If n is 1, then 1. Otherwise, we add together the fib of n minus 1 and n minus 2. That's elegant, but it's horrible because all those re recursions entail recalculating. So the stream with memoization has the beauty of an elegant definition, and the beauty of an elegant execution. Um, and this is a version of what's known, and you guys will study this in algorithms, it's known as dynamic programming. And those of you who took Computing 4 in the last like couple of years, I don't know if you remember there was a problem set that used dynamic programming. Does anybody remember which one it was? Yeah, it was the string alignment one. That's right, this, the edit distance, where that one has a very elegant recursive definition that is computationally like explosive and no one can ever use. But when you reformulate it as working from the bottom towards the top, so you, you sort of invert the recursion, then at any point when you want a result, it's already there for you. Um, so that's a general approach that is used in a lot of algorithm design. Um, so you sort of get this for free with streams, with memoization. Um, yeah. Any questions or comments? Yeah, Tim. The uh, memoization problem in PS8B. Yeah. You're asking us to different um, out of like how many additions for the fifth. Yeah. Let's actually look at that and get your question answered.
Um, it's this one, right? Okay. So, what's the question? Um, are we so for the fifth two with my mom? Yeah. Um, well, actually, for the fifth three with my mom, are we assuming that the stream ref fifth two was already previously called? The memoization is in place. Or are we taking each one individually? Oh, okay. Good question. All right. So Tim's question is: Are when we're doing like the second one of these questions, how many additions to calculate? Um, Fib three, um, are we assuming that this one has already happened and then it's additional ones? Or is the question like you're just straight out of the gate calling uh, fib th the stream ref fib of three and then how many additions will it take? That's a really good question. Um, do you want to explain why they're different? Explain why they're different, Tim. Um. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, I want it the version where nothing has happened yet. Okay, so take each one as its own Yeah, yeah, so take, treat, treat each of those separately. So in other words, if you rearrange the order, you would get the same answers. That's another way of saying it, kind of complicated way of saying it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when you guys do this, it will all come together. This is like the key problem, really. In many ways, this is the key problem, the problem set. I think it's the last one. Yep, so you got to work your way to the end. Okay, um, so now I want to show you some stuff with primes. Um, I'm going to stay on the, on the machine. So I'm going to show you three different ways of calculating primes from like simpler to more complicated. Okay, so simple way is um, fairly simple. We're going to make a little um, prime testing function. This first one is does not use stream. It, this first thing, there's no stream stuff at all. This is a little prime testing function that I wrote to just give it a number. It says whether or not it's prime. Okay, so first off, it says one is not prime, just by definition. Um, two is prime by definition. Um, then, like, there's a little optimization there. Any even number is not prime. Okay, so that's the first three lines of code. Otherwise, uh, we're going to use this trick. We're basically going to we're going to check all the factor. We're going to check all the numbers starting at three up until only up until the square root of the number. Because once you go beyond the square root, you're checking factors that would be there if you like were going the other way. So that's the once we so once we iterate the factor beyond limit which limits the square root. Once we go above, uh, we're counting up. Is it divisible by 3? Is it divisible by 4? Or actually, we're going to count by 2. So is it divisible by 3? Is it divisible by 5, 7, 9, 11, so on? Once we pass the square root, well, we haven't found any factors, so yes, it's prime. If any of the factors divides with the remainder of 0, then no, it's not prime. And otherwise, we keep trying, and we're gonna be, we tested the even ones. We can iterate by 2. So that's a little prime testing function. Um, we can just hand it a number, and it will tell us whether or not the number is prime. Does anybody know a big prime number just offhand? I don't. It's 101 prime. Okay, that's prime. Okay, so we can generate a list of primes by just simply doing a stream filter over our list of um, of natural numbers. So. Here's a list of natural numbers using the more sort of straightforward, like infinite recursion. And so nats is a list of all the natural numbers, uh, sorry, stream. And so we can, um, we can make a, a, a stream of primes. Um, yeah, just filtering that list. So that totally works. There's nothing like particularly clever about it. So we can say what's the... Um, 100,001th prime number. Um, it takes a little bit of time to do that. So now it's actually walking through, testing each one, right? If you guys like look up here, you can see the processor load on my computer. Um, there's a table on the web of the first 100,000 prime numbers, and it happens to mention that the 
100,000 and eighth one is that value 1 million and change. So we can ask for that one. That's the, uh, sorry, that's the 100,000 and eighth prime number. By the way, why didn't that take very long? Because of memorization. Yeah, right. All those other ones were memorized. Okay. Um, so this thing actually, like, will... It, it, I, I didn't pick 100,000 by accident. I think at, at 200,000, I think I run out of memory. So I'll let this crank for a while. I have the available memory set reasonably low. Oh, that still worked. All right. We're going to try these again with different values and different approaches. Yeah, okay. So, ran out of memory. Um, and there's not that, like, I've got 128 megs of memory, and we already ran out, like, and I don't even know how many primes are in that list, right, in that stream. Do we have a primitive that counts how many things are in the stream? We don't really, because it would just keep going, especially with an infinite stream. Um, but somewhere between, like, trying the 200,000th prime... Oh, no, we do. This is, this is the 200,000th prime. So between the 200 and 300,000th prime, we ran out of 128 megs of memory. So I approximately calculated it to be, like, 500 bytes per object in the, screen, in the stream, which is, like, not nothing. All right, fine. Let's do a more clever way. Um, what we're going to do now for our, our prime predicate is instead of like walking up every possible factor with an offset of 2, instead of going 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, we're going to use the primes we've previously generated as the possible divisors. So we're going to be, now uh, the name for our primes is going to be prime stream. It's just a, it's a, so we're not having name collisions. I gave it a different name. Still this idea of stopping when we get past the square root. We're still going to build an iterator. But now what we're going to do is we're going to grab our, our possible divisors by the list of primes that we've already generated. So this should be lots more efficient because we're not testing nearly as many factors. We're only testing the, um, the prime numbers that we previously generated. So that's the whole story. So we're grabbing a prime number from our from the car of our stream of primes. This when we kick off the iterator, we're giving it the whole stream that we've previously generated. When we do our iteration, we do it on the cutter of that stream. So each time we get the next prime number. All right. So let's see how that works. Um, here we go. We're going to use this one. So it should be faster because it's doing less like math. Was that any faster than the other one? Maybe a little bit faster. Not substantially faster. Um, let's let's play with the memory and see if the this other implementation runs out of memory faster. Um, so remember the this one like died between two hundred thousand and three hundred thousand. Let's see if this one's able to go to two hundred thousand. It's not substantially faster. Okay, so more or less the same story. And I think it dies at 300,000. Wait, that worked. Why did that work and the other one didn't?
Okay, and now let's go to the other one, which doesn't like look to the list of primes. Hold on, we have to, um, in order for this to be a fair test, we have to reevaluate the buffer. Okay. How could the simpler one use up memory faster? Let me get them both on the screen at once. Well, that's, this is the more complicated one that uses it's the stream of primes it built up for the iteration testing. This is the other one that doesn't. Why does it use up memory faster? Yeah, go on, Tim. It's using two streams. Why does that matter? Yeah, so right on. So this one has, it's building up the stream of, um, of natural numbers. And when we tried to generate the 300,000th prime, that doesn't mean that there's way more than 300,000 numbers in the stream of integers. So that stream had to keep getting forced to generate the numbers that were being tested. I don't know offhand how big that is, but it's certainly in the millions primes start to get somewhat sparse, right, when you get out there. Um, so that, that other stream got forced to be pretty big. And so that's where we ran out of memory. Whereas with the, the more clever method, this is the intermediate clever method, because I'm going to show you the clever, clever method. Um, we only have one stream. It's a stream of primes. OK. Okay, here's the sieve of Eratosthenes. So the cool thing is, like, how long ago he came up with this? Um, we're going to recursively define the primes by filtering out from the stream of primes each prime number that we find. Let me get the whole thing on the screen, and then we'll, we'll talk about it. So we start out with... Um, our initial hypothesis is that all integers starting at 2 are prime. And then we go and run, this is the sieve of Eratosthenes. So, okay, so it will say, yes, the head of that stream is prime. So we started out with a prime number. If we don't, it's going to fail. Um, but then the cutter of the next item in the sieve numbers is the result of filtering out, in this case, will be all the twos from the stream. So this creates a new stream with all the twos filtered out. That's the cutter of the, of the um, initial stream. So um, how are we going to get, where does this next item come from? We're stream filtering not divisible by, in this case it's a two, from the cutter of this stream. So what is the cutter of the initial stream? It's a three. The initial stream is the stream of all natural numbers. Um, so that one will make it through the sieve, because three is not divisible by two. So that one will become the second item in the output stream. And then it will be the first item in the recursion. So then the three becomes the filter for, um, for the next recursion. But remember, that's wrapped around a sieve that's pulling out all the things that are divisible by two. So it will never see the four. The ints from two will generate a four, but the initial sieve will get rid of that. And so the next thing that the thing that's dividing by three will see is a five, and that will succeed. And so it will generate another. That will be appended to the stream. So this works amazingly, except, I mean, so it works. It's just brilliant. Um, and this is just described, like, more than 2,000 years ago. And, like, look how few lines of code it takes to create it. Um, it turns out it's not very good with memory because you've got all of these sieves running around 
like cast. So each new prime number generates its own like stream. Um, and those things just like stack up. So I, I don't think it can, it can even get to um, the 107th uh, like prime. So if we do stream ref, um, the primes with the sieve, and we want the one that worked with both the other things. Yeah, can't do it. So the moral of the story is streams are really cool, um, and you have to deeply understand how they use memory. Um, and this is like this is a, like a, a general trade-off with all sorts of coding. Um, I was in a meeting with Bill Maloney this week, and who teaches our operating systems courses and, and architecture. And Bill works very close to the hardware, and he was saying. You know, when you're dealing with big data, you can't use dynamic languages like Java even because the way it uses memory, you just can't control. Of course, this is the way Bill loves to work. So, but at the same time, it is this constant, like, you need to know your tool. You need to have a reason about what it's doing. And sometimes these beautiful abstractions are, like, make you efficient. And other times, they're so inefficient that you can't use them. So that's it. See you guys on Wednesday. Have fun with the problem set. Well, it's it, it, it's it's essentially the README file. In the README file in your repository should explain um, sort of like the proposal. It's all the same things that the proposal asks you to explain. But will explain what you actually did. So do we need to have just an interface or we can just racket to run and get our I mean, if you should have some sort of demonstration that can show your program work. So, yeah, basically we run the racket like every user and then we mod two pictures together. Mm -hmm. We have the sketch like by the pencil raw. This is like similar. Pencil, that's what you're saying. Yeah, the pencil raw. Pencil. Yeah. Right. The yeah, that's one. Okay. Yeah, so... Because before you're saying cartoon. Yeah. Right? Right, so it's just I was trying to like connect the ideas. Yeah, because the, the first one we try to get get a cartoon, but like, this one is similar. Like the first thing we use the blur, mm -hmm. motion blur, filter. And yeah. After that, we use the invert. I mean, you still have like a whole week. So my guess is that you should make your project more sophisticated. So if I were you, I'd do things like pull. Like, can you pull an image off the net and then convert it and display it? Or even just like you provide a URL to an image and it downloads it and converts it and displays it. Something like so that it has a, a, a GUI. Yeah, GUI. Yeah. I mean, if you're done, you're done. Like if, you know, if you don't want to spend any more time on it, you just want to write it up, then you can write it up. Yeah. So let me talk with that. Yeah. All right.